Hello, I'm Chris Hartwell, and welcome to The Heartbeat, the place where I talk about just a few of the things that make this little guy tick. Today, I'm going to be talking about episode 9, Roman numeral, of season 2 of HBO's The Leftovers. Join me, won't you? So, the pendulum swings back, not only from purgatory slash Kevin's imagination back to the real world, but from these extremely compressed time-wise previous two episodes to this sprawling of an epic episode, which structurally was even more extreme than this season's second episode, where we go from Maple to New York with the Garveys and Nora all the way over to Jardin, Texas. Now, I was about ready to make a comparison to this episode, to last season's penultimate episode, The Garbies at Their Best, but before I do, I realize some of you are not as big of fans of me comparing and contrasting this season to last season, and more especially, not huge fans of me comparing this season to other television shows or movies such as Lost, The Shining, or Birdman. And I wasn't going to say anything, but I actually ended up reading an interview with Damon Lindelof this week where he compared this season to the film Picnic at Hanging Rock. And though I personally actually have not seen the film, just looking at the synopsis of the film, I found it incredibly interesting to learn that the film was all about these girls that had gone missing. But the first thing that we, the audience, are told via title card is that they are never found. So not only was it enlightening to know that Lindelof had seen that film, but that he also knew the audience's response to it, which was one of, even though they'd been told from the outset that they weren't going to find out what happened to these girls, the audience by the end was still booing, standing up in the theater and shouting at the screen. It was also fascinating to learn the fact that Lindelof, prior to the writing of the season, had watched a documentary on the World War II Blitz that depicted these Londoners going about their daily routine, all the while knowing that an air raid could start again at any time. And learning about both of those things this week really did excite me, and I think also highlighted well why I enjoy so much holding up the leftovers to other shows and films. Though still, let me just say, to each his own, honestly. And I do apologize if my approach to reviewing The Leftovers isn't your cup of tea, or if the shows I'm comparing and contrasting it to haven't been seen by you, or if you don't like them, I totally get that. At the same time, I just wanted to explain why I do what I do. I think one of the first reasons is just the fact that not only am I fascinated by the growth and evolution of the characters in front of the camera, but also those behind, whether it be Mr. Lindelof or Mr. Tom Parada. And two, and I think this is a little more universally accepted, I really think that in contrasting the differences or comparing the similarities of this show to another one, we are given a clear picture of what it's doing, but also potentially where it's going. So for example, looking at this image here, it may be difficult to perceive what exactly it is, but if you introduce and hold up contrasting tones, that image then becomes clear. Now, I'm fairly certain that most of you have seen this image and are aware that you can see both a duck and a rabbit, but, if you were having trouble seeing the duck, it could then be helpful to hold up an image of a duck next to it, and the same would be true of a rabbit. Furthermore, if the artist who created this piece has actually told us he only ever intended it to be seen as one animal, and we wanted to know what animal that was, it might be helpful to know things like, oh, this artist has only ever drawn rabbits, or oh, he's actually never even seen a duck. And yes, <laughs> the example is ridiculous and extreme, I know, but I think you get what I'm saying. So, to jump back to The Leftovers, I did want to compare and contrast this episode to last season's penultimate episode, The Garvey's at Their Best. Both do seem quite similar in their objective, that being we've spent this time with these characters, watching them carry out these actions, but without necessarily knowing why they're carrying them out. So for this episode, we actually journey back in time to get some of the answers to those questions. For example, with Meg, we learn that it's not a relative departing that's fueled her action for the last two seasons, but the death of her mother just prior, which in a lot of ways is quite similar to Kevin, where she, just moments before losing her family, is completely undervaluing them. And we see once again Mr. Lindelof is using flashbacks, just like he did on Lost, to illuminate the foundation of these characters, sometimes in kind of overt ways, like when Meg's mother says to her, Megan, you are the most relentless person I know. And yes, I have been both excited and quite nervous to see when and how the worlds of Mapleton and Jarden were going to come together this season. Because it seemed to me anyways, in looking at episode 3, as awesome as that episode was, they couldn't always remain separate. They had to eventually collide. Which in a lot of ways is quite similar to the first season, where we had the lives of Kevin and Nora over here, and the lives of the Guilty Remnant over here. Where each had their own kind of isolated storyline, which we ultimately discover have been leading to this very satisfying satisfying, albeit devastating, collision by the season's end. But the challenge of bringing those two worlds together this season was even greater, if only just because of the geography. I mean, what on earth was going to bring Meg all the way from New York, all the way to Texas? 
Well, of course, had I studied my Lindelof screenwriting 101, I would have known already. She's been there before, on a pilgrimage of her own to discover what her mother's final words were going to be, from the psychic Isaac. And you know what? I did actually believe that Meg would have had this prior connection to Jarden, if only because Lindelof, on this show anyways, hasn't yet overplayed the so-and-so no so-and-so, or so-and-so's related to so-and-so card. One that after six seasons was starting to feel just a little bit contrived on Lost. But here, though, I found it so, so cool that Meg and Evie's motivations rather effortlessly intersected as they kind of came to the same conclusion about Jarden. And I love, love, love when Mr. Lundeloff, when he's at his best, has his characters kind of talk around an issue. A whole scene can be comprised of people eating baby carrots and telling knock-knock jokes, and yet at the same time actually be about communicating how miserable those characters are and how let down they are about the miraculous place that they find themselves in. And of course, Meg's spitting on Jarden really does tell us that she has some unfinished business with that place, further prepping us for her return. And I gotta say, this was the first episode that really got me to invest in Evie as a person and try and figure out what does this person want, and how does that play into her disappearance? From there, wham, we get this great, very cinematic transition out of that flashback, seamlessly moving from one bus to another and through time. And it was here that that sneaky little Lindelof really started to play us, because not only was watching Meg unpin that grenade and toss it into the school bus full of children, planting the seed of the idea that Meg was at least okay with blowing things up, also the way the episode's director, Keith Gordon, framed that shot as Meg is walking away from that school bus. With her face being shoved into one corner of the frame tells us that we should be ready for something to happen somewhere else, i.e. a bus blowing up which he used again in the migrant camp scene between Meg and Matt. And it really just put me on the edge of my seat, like, what's gonna happen over in that corner of the frame? Is she gonna kill Matt? Is she gonna blow something up? And that misdirection continues quite well in the next scene between Meg and the other Guilty Remnant leaders, a scene that I enjoyed all the more because it really did demonstrate how Lindelof had evolved the Guilty Remnant as a whole, allowing us to see through Meg's now dubious eyes. So we, along with her, don't have to put up with as much of their mysterious mumbo-jumbo anymore. Even as I say that, though, Meg is certainly not above being Miss Mysterious on this episode. I mean, she is intentionally misguiding characters just as much as Lindelof is misguiding us this episode. I mean, poor... Tom. Not only is the tension masterfully directed in that moment where Meg enters the room where Tom has been speaking, but when Tom asks her, do you want me to take your pain away? Oh, and just the look on Tommy's face does once again what the show has done so well from the outset, which is subtly communicate, oftentimes in these beautiful nonverbal moments, who these individuals are and really what they believe. And, and it's in this moment I must stand corrected and admit Tommy certainly does not believe that he has the power to take away people's pain. And from there, the rest of the episode did a really great job of continuing to illustrate and show what fuels Tommy. He's that lonely, abandoned dog, and he needs a cause. He needs something to fight for, a battle to find his identity in, and a way to prove that he is not his father or his stepfather, who would both let down those who were closest to them. Which is exactly what Meg seems to know, and why she's so easily able to bait him with, I can do this for real. And why I continue to believe that she's actually just lying to him, and just trying to reel him in by saying things like, I want to get you pregnant. Ugh. And the moment right before she drops that bomb is so Damon. We're finally able to breathe as we watch this very simple, undramatic scene between Tommy and Meg as they dance together. But all I could think was, careful Tommy, Damon is about to crush you. And then he did. <laughs> Which also made the scene later in the episode between Matt and Meg all the more refreshing as Matt saw directly through her BS. Especially with that zinger then I apologize for being your living reminder. Aw, uh, yeah, Matt. Now to talk about a few of the things that didn't work perfectly for me in this episode, I think one of the downsides to the very strong point of view type storytelling that this season has been all about on The Leftovers is sometimes those points of view aren't perfectly complementary with one another. It's like this whole season has been this glorious 10 course meal, each episode being a different course. And as tasty as each of those courses is, they can sometimes undermine one another if they're not served in the right order or if we're not given enough of a palate cleanse between each course. Talking about last week's episode, even its director, Craig Zobel, who hoped that it would play and feel part of the same universe, also admitted, 
By the end, we are doing some pretty weird stuff in that well. And though I personally loved that weird stuff and thought it played very well, I have to admit at the top of this week's episode, I did experience a certain level of whiplash. It was kind of like I was very abruptly served this new course or maybe returned to an old one. Nonetheless, it didn't allow me to, in the first few minutes anyways, fully enjoy and engage with the episode because I wasn't given enough of a palate cleanse to enjoy this new dish, nor was I really being given time to further digest the rather insanely unique one that I was served last week. And in some ways, it kind of reminded me of the insane intercutting on a film like Cloud Atlas. Even as I wasn't a huge fan of that film overall, I did enjoy some of the individual storylines, but that was significantly diminished as I was thrown from one to the next, the filmmakers never seeming to find a way to fully make them complement one another. With that said, if I had to justify the whiplash I experienced this week, last week, Kevin, like those who visit Jarden, really had this mountaintop spiritual experience. And now this week, we've been thrown back with those who are denied anything miraculous or meaningful in their lives, which is what Evie must feel like living in Jarden. And another task that Damon and the writers have had this year, one that I do not envy at all, is just the fact that they've tried to surprise the audience. And to have success in surprising an audience is really about finding the balance between planting clues, planting road markers along the way, but also withholding a certain amount of information. And if you err too far on the withholding, when things are revealed, they'll feel very unjustified and very contrived. But if you err too far on the road marker side of things, planting too many seeds, you'll see it coming from a mile away. And it's actually the latter of those two, planting too many seeds, that I felt like was one of the main issues from House of Cards Season 2. Though the first season had surprised me with its final reveal of what Kevin Spacey's character was aiming for, and just how he was going about getting it, the second season was so predictable, as the writers just tried to replicate that same structure. And though I certainly don't think that Lindelof and Prada fell prey to that misstep this season, there were certain moments in this last episode, I have to admit, things felt just a little thinly set up. Even as I enjoyed the reveal that Evie had joined the GR. That particular element not feeling rushed or unjustified to me, with the scenes between Meg and her earlier in this episode, as well as certain moments in the season 2 premiere. On top of that, having that be the reveal continued to tie the show together in a very satisfying way for me. With that said though, Meg's grand scheme, whatever it turns out to be, does feel just a little bit abrupt. I mean, it is the 11th hour after all, and it's only now that we're learning that the primary adversary from season one is still the primary adversary from season two. Right down to the fact that we very suddenly see a clock counting down to October 14th. I hadn't till now even realized people were looking forward to that. And because this episode is already insanely supersized, I will just wrap things up right now by saying next week I am looking forward to everything. I cannot wait to find out what happens to each of these characters. I cannot wait to have things further revealed about them and what they want and what they're aiming for. I cannot wait to see collisions happen. I'm excited for all of it and a little bit terrified as well. And I will close everything out with a nice quote from Damon Lindelof where he said, Among other reasons, emotional reasons, that's why Patty's final soliloquy down in that well was about Jeopardy. Because you have to give your answer in the form of a question. And it's because of that approach that it's so enjoyable to theorize and to ask questions of my own and to come on here and talk to you guys. So talk back to me. Let me know what you guys thought of the episode. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Were you surprised by the ending? Did you get whiplash at all at the beginning of the episode? Comment below. Let me know. Also, please do subscribe. I'm going to continue to review films and television on this channel, and I would love for you all to stay up to date on all of those things. But for now, I'm Chris Hartwell. This is The Heartbeat. Thank you for joining me.